I'm Harry Rock, and welcome to another edition of the Westfield Council on Aging Presents. This is a special collaborative between Tina Gorman, Executive Director of the Westfield Council on Aging and the Westfield Senior Center, and Pete Coles, who is the producer of WCPC Westfield Cable Channel 15. Our topic today is Valued and Creative Aging. What is the recipe? And my guest today, and I am thrilled <laughs> to have the person who has brainstormed. This is our 12th episode. It's hard to believe we're it now is. at one year that we started this series. Yep. Tina Gorman, the one and only. Hello there. The one and only Tina Gorman, <laughs> Executive Director of the Westfield Council on Aging and the Westfield Senior Center. The person that every senior in Westfield knows <laughs> and follows you to wherever you want them to go. So uh, you have done such a phenomenal job with all the programming and all the um, services that you provide. So I was thrilled. Uh, normally, you're the one that's feeding me the names of mm -hmm. guests yep. and topics, and I'm researching all that. And then she said, here's what we're doing this month, and I'll be doing it. I right. said, oh, boy, I've got <laughs> Tina herself, which is always yeah. a lot of fun. So, Tina, you know, I was uh, kind of prepping for this last night and looking through the notes that you had sent me. And, you know, this is certainly a topic that probably none of us want to think about. Yeah. But we all know that we have to address sooner or later. And as I'm looking at my white hair, I'm realizing that I'm well into that group as well of really how do we keep ourselves current, feeling young, mm -hmm. and keeping our minds sharp as anything. So yeah. let's kind of dive into it and see what you've got for us today. Great. Let's do it, Harry. Well, I think the good news is that there is a, there is a recipe. So I'm going to share I that know, recipe that. for valued and creative aging. So I'm going to start with an email that I saved. I received this email way back in 2004. Um, and uh, I was at the time I was teaching at Springfield College, which yes. used to teach at Springfield. So, um, and it was before I started here at the senior center. So here's the email. Uh, the woman's name who sent this to me was Claire, and I met Claire just to give you a little context. I uh, for a number of years I was the uh, director of social services at a local skilled nursing facility, and we really focused on rehab. And Claire's son had had uh, a traumatic brain injury, and he was on my rehab unit. So that's how I got to know her. And she, at the time, was, um, I want to say, probably right around 80 years old. And so anyway, we kept in touch over the years. And so she sent me this email in 2004, and she said, Hi, can't remember when I last chatted with you, so we'll bring you up to date on my doings. I'm now living with an old friend in Lemonster. His wife died a couple of years ago, and because we have been friends for so long, we decided to spend the rest of our lives together. I moved in in August, and I'm still trying to get things in place. It's one thing to move to an empty house, quite another to one that's already furnished. The results are eclectic at best. Jim will be 88 on Saturday, and I reached 87 in July. Tell your students it's never too late for a new love. <laughs> We're adjusting well and having a happy time. How blessed we are. And, you know, there are certain older adults that have I've met through the years, mostly through my work, um, some personally, that are just, you know, I call them my idols, um, just the kind of people that I would like to emulate and the kind of people that I think, oh, that's the kind of person I want to be yeah. as I age. And, of course, I've been saying that for 20 years, and <laughs> now I'm in my almost mid-60s, so, right. you know, I'm, I'm there. Um, and Claire was one of them. She was amazingly involved in the state head injury program. I mean, she, you know, was political in that respect, um, owned a bed and breakfast with her husband when he had been alive. Um, so I just loved hearing from her and she lived to be in her 90s so I started as I put together this presentation of valued and creative aging sort of looking at some of those people that in my life over the years mm. most of them now have passed away but you know what was it about them that made them you know my role models mm -hmm. um, so Claire was one of them Another one was Gus, and a lot of our viewers will remember Gus because he was he frequented the old senior center every day. So Gus was a regular at the senior center until he passed away at the age of 99. Wow. He was there every day. He was a member of the Do Re Mi uh, choral group. 
He sang with the Do Re Mi's. He um, participated. We used to have a group called Talking Books. It was kind of a read aloud. He participated in that and those discussions. He played the organ and the keyboard. He exercised every single day. And he kept up with current events. He could hold his own on any kind of a conversation. He had an amazingly wonderful sense of humor. And I think that's why, you know, mm. people were just attracted to him. Gus, I didn't meet Gus until um, he was more than, he was o- older than 90 when I first met him because he had learned the computer. By the time I met him, he had already learned the computer. But he learned the computer at the old senior center at the age of 90. Wow. And he did it because he wanted to be able to communicate with his grandchildren and his great-grandchildren via email. And oh, he knew that the only way, well, because that's the way they were communicating. Right. And instead of sitting home wishing that they would communicate with him by phone or by snail mail, it was like, well, if, if, if I'm going to stay current with what's going on in their lives, then I need to enter their world. And that meant email. And that meant having to learn the computer. And by the way, I found out when Gus, at his, um, at his uh, memorial ceremony or memorial service, that and I didn't know this. He ha- he had a Facebook page. I mean, he died at ninety nine and had and he was on Facebook. And wow. I didn't even realize that. But again, it was another way right. to communicate. Good for so him. I brought I brought a couple of props in with me, <laughs> and I just have to. Oh sure. Do my this picture hangs in my office. This is a picture of Gus and me. I don't know. If We're gonna you, have you. Uh, let's that way. This way? Let's Where am see. I? I know I'm looking. Yeah, I'm here. trying to figure out which camera I producer know. Pete's got us on yeah, there. Okay. Um, well, anyway, this is a picture of Gus and actually, me. If you hand it to me, I can put it right over here. I can get there it up go. close. So, this is on. Uh, Pete, does that work? It, it's Halloween. Uh, and I am. Where are you? Uh, nope. I'm not sure which. Oh, he's working. over on this one. You know what? I'm going to walk <laughs> it over. So. Harry's going to walk it over. Good, because I have another. Nope. Oh, there you go. Put it down a little bit. There you go. There it is. Okay, so that's this wonderful picture of Gus and me. I'm dressed up as a flapper. Oh, that's you. Yes, that's me. I'm dressed up as a flapper. So my hair was short. And I'm dressed up as a flapper, <laughs> a 1920s flapper. And Gus, it was Halloween. And I'm giving Gus a big fat smooch on his cheek. <laughs> and the thing that I love about this picture, and I had it blown up into an 8x10. So I had a 5x7, and I made it for Gus. And he just absolutely loved it and he put it on his refrigerator and I had said to him Gus you know I don't do you think you should put it on your refrigerator like what's your family gonna say and he said oh I hope I start all kinds of rumors with my family you know that was just the kind of person that he was so um so so that's my Gus person and you know he was one of those gee I hope when I live to be the right right 99 that I you know sort of have that zest for life Um, and you know the interesting thing we're going to talk about some of the you know the ingredients to the recipe but I asked Gus one time because I had gone over to his house a few times to drop things off and um, he showed me his little room he had a little extra bedroom and he had you know a little set of weights and some you know bands and things that he did and I said to him he said to me I exercise every single day for about a half an hour And we got to talking about why he did that. And he said, it isn't that I'm in love with exercise, but he said, I want to be able to get in and out of the bathtub, you know, bring my groceries in, put them away. You know, he said, I just want to be able to do what we would consider to be activities of daily living without help if as long as I can. And I really want to stay out of a nursing home if I possibly can. And he did, you know, I mean, he, that was one of his goals, but he, he knew that. So we'll talk a little bit about how exercise fits into the recipe a little bit yeah, later absolutely. on. Yeah, um, absolutely. But I want to start with, uh, and I know I mentioned this on another presentation that I had done, which is the, the uh, Harvard Study of Adult Development. Right. It's a very large study. It is the longest longitudinal study of adult life that's ever been conducted. Um, the study began in 1938. That's amazing. It is, and it is currently more than 80 years old. And they started with several hundred subjects. They are down to 19 of them. They're all in their mid to late 90s right. at this point. Um, <clears throat> but they are now actually into the second generation. So they're now studying the second generation of that cohort uh, that they started out with. With, And they actually had 
the original study, they had two groups of men and a group of women, um, and they were studied from adolescence into late life. And the information that they gathered, I mean, they just gathered tons and tons of information yeah. about these people. They looked at everything. They looked at their physical health. They looked at their emotional health. They looked at finances, education, mm. family. Were they married? Were they not married? Um, did they have mental health issues along the way? Were there issues with alcohol or drugs mm. or, you know, they just, just everything. They covered everything and they would, they would, what they did was they followed them every year and then, like, every two years, they would do sort of a basic physical. But every five years, you know, they would bring them in and they would go through this, you know, extensive. Um, and so, you know, sort of uh, testing and testing and so forth. And so th- what happened was is over the course of the 80 years that they've done this study, they've gone through four different directors of the study because, you know, the person in charge of it would age out and, you know, retire. Oh, sure. and you know what I mean? Right. So. Um, But what was really fascinating to me, Harry, was they originally, when they originally started, the first director was really mostly looking at physical health. Mm. You know, how can people, and remember too, this was 1938. So how can people, and why is it that some people live longer? Why Why do some people live into their 80s and 90s and even over 100 and some, you know, pass away in their 60s or 70s? So that was where the focus originally started, but as they gathered the information, there were a lot of other factors that they realized were important. So, mm. you know, mental health, it's, it's kind of what we're seeing now with COVID, and we're hearing more and more about children in school and right. mental health right. issues and their mental and their emotional mm-hmm. well being as being just as important as mm-hmm. did you learn your math and reading. Right. And it's the same type of thing. You start to really find out about all these other things. So in the end, what it boiled down to was they they came up, the Harvard study found four attributes that are vital to successful aging. And they may surprise you because I think most people would think of, you know, like, well, my diet has to be this. And you know what I mean? You're thinking physical, physical, physical. I have to, you know, see the doctor. I have to take my medications. And all of that is important. But these were the four things they found. One was an orientation toward the future, the ability to anticipate, to plan, to hope at all ages, including you know, Claire, who was in her 80s and mm. decided to, you know, live with the, yeah. she and her friend of many years who they were both widowed by then. Right. You know, and it wasn't like, well, Jim, 87, I, you know, I've already been married. I'm not going <laughs> to, you know, it was kind of like, well, yeah, but who knows how we might have another 10 years and think right. of how great that could be. Yeah. So that was one of them. Uh, gratitude, forgiveness, and optimism. They kind of lump those together, but I'm going to tease those yeah, out. Those are but, good. Okay, so we need to see the glass is half full and yeah. not half empty. So those people who really can see positive. the glass, right, that yeah. positivism. Keep away from the negativity. Yep, really has an yep. effect on healthy aging. Empathy, mm. the ability to uh, imagine the world as it seems to the other person. Mm-hmm. And that one, I think, is a lot easier said than done. And we'll talk more about that in a minute mm-hmm. too and then relationships mm-hmm. a desire to be with other people so and that, that speaks to yes your, your and we're going to talk earlier. a lot about that right. because when it all boiled down to everything it was really the relationships that were right. the most important so um i have a quote uh this is from the book and i wish i had the book to show you, but I don't because I lend this book out to so many people. So my sister-in-law has it right now. This is taken from the book, If I Live to Be 100. Have you ever heard of that? No, I haven't. It was written by Nina Ellis. And uh, Nina Ellis worked for National Public Radio for many years. And at, at, at the turn of the century, at 2000, she did a series for NPR on centenarians, Mm-hmm. Older adults who live to be a hundred years old, and she it she had ta- it, she had spent about a year interviewing people. She went all over the country. She interviewed men, women, one couple. She interviewed a couple that were both centenarians, oh, wow. husband and wife who had lived to be. I don't know. They were married like eighty years. Or, it was wow. unbelievable. Uh, races, various races. Uh, really fascinating book. And each chapter is about a separate person. So it kind of you you know each chapter kind of stands alone. Um, but anyway, I heard the series was done 
uh, in, during the year 2000 on NPR once a month. So they would do one interview a month, and it was about a 15-minute segment. Hmm. The very first month, they did it on Anna Wilmot, who had been a resident of Westfield, Massachusetts. Oh, my goodness. So I'm listening to this going, oh, my gosh, <laughs> this woman lives in the town next door. I've got to meet her because when I heard the interview, I just thought – She's on my list of, you know, oh, role sure. model people. So this is taken from the book, If I Live to Be a Hundred by Nina Ellis. And she's describing, she she does a, you know, she, she kind of writes about the interview and she writes what she asked and what Anna said. But then she says this, she says, Anna Wilmot tells me about the Great Depression, how she and Frederick nearly lost everything. Frederick was Anna's husband. How she learned to be frugal and survive on very little. She is not sad or even wistful. It was hard, but she survived. We've been talking for less than two hours when she says, I think that about covers everything. I mean, this is a woman who's 100 right, years old, right. just gave you my life story two hours. Okay. I convince her, says Nina, that I have a lot more questions, and she seems surprised. It occurs to me that Anna doesn't care to talk about the past. She's living in the present, making plans for the future, that future orientation, that. right? Right. I met Anna when she was 105 years old. Oh my when goodness. I started working at the Westfield Senior Center, it was the first I found out that she was a client in our companion program. And at the time, Fran Aguda was coordinating that program. My first day on the job, I said to Fran, I have to meet Anna Wilmot. <laughs> and Fran said, I can make that happen. Anna lived over at Hampton Ponds. Okay. Granny Annie, they used to call her. She would row her boat. She was still rowing her oh boat. Oh, my on, goodness. Remember, right? They did a story yes. in the paper on her. Yes. I remember because that Because one time somebody stole her oars. Yes. I and that made that. national news. Oh, my gosh. I Oh, my gosh. Yep. Yes. So I, I met Anna when she was 105. Yep. We celebrated her 106th birthday at the Senior Center with a small gathering. Here's my second prop. <laughs> <laughs> Here you go, Harry. All right. Oh, good. You can just hold it up, Harry. I got it on camera five. Oh, good. Perfect. Camera Wherever up. camera five is. We don't know where it's that camera. is. It's aimed right at you, Tina, so you can hold the picture. Oh, okay. I don't know where camera five is. I don't either. We've got so many cameras in here. Oh, now. there we go. It's the one up on the white side. There we go. Okay. Oh. So this is a picture of Anna on her birthday. Anna's in the pink sweater. I'm standing behind her. I know there's a little bit of a, there we go. And Fran Aguda and Joanne Godier are in the picture. They were both COA staff at the time. This was taken at the old senior center on her 106th birthday. Um, Anna was just one of the most delightful people I've ever met. I mean, 105, she had all of her faculties. She was yeah. still kind of, you know, running around. She was kind of spry. Her stories, her delightful sense of humor, her rowboat, um, you know, the people who just cared for her and about her. She was a people magnet. And she had this tiny little cottage on Hampton Pond. So when we went to visit her, it was the, it was the, um, there were four of us, four or five of us. So she's sitting in her chair, you know, sort of everybody, <laughs> they all have a chair, right? So she's sitting in her chair and she had an ottoman. And the other staff members were, you know, kind of sitting around. And so there was really no place for me to sit. And so I sat on the ottoman. So, you know, I'm, so here I am at Anna Wilmot's feet. And she, and I'm just, I was a little kid. She started telling stories. And mm. they were just, I, they were so fun and so interesting. And I was just like, okay, tell another story. You know, tell another <laughs> story. I mean, it was just, she was just that kind of a person. And I think what Nina Ellis said was right. She was very oriented. You know, she was happy to tell funny stories about the past, but was definitely living in the present and still talking about, about the future. The future. Right. And, you know, the, the, the really interesting thing was Anna had one son. His name was Freddie, same as her husband's name, her, her husband who had passed away. Freddie and his wife Lily lived out in California. So, of course, they can only come visit, you know, because think about it. When I met Anna, she was 105. Freddie was in his 80s. Oh my Freddie gosh. was like in his mid-80s. Lily was younger than he was, his wife. So they would come out usually once a year. Well, it finally got to the point where they decided with Anna that she was going to move to California. So at the age of like 106, Anna picks up and moves out to California <laughs> to be with Freddie and Lily. But that's not the, that isn't even the end of the story. I thought that was amazing. Lily was Filipino, 
Hmm. And she and so Freddie and Lily actually owned two homes, one in California and one in the Philippines. Hmm. So Lily had talked to us about Anna moving out to California. And she was very concerned. You know, she wanted her to be able to adjust and so forth. Well, Anna being Anna and being that future oriented and just being that very positive kind of person went out to California adjusted beautifully and said, well, don't you two go to the Philippines? When are we doing that? She ended up going to the Philippines, moving to the Philippines, because they would spend six months and six months. She got out to the Philippines and absolutely loved it. And they stayed there Hmm. and until she passed away at the age of 110. And Lily would send me emails with updates and pictures and, you know, Mother's Day and her birthday and so forth. And Lily said the month before she died, she was walking around on the beach you know she said I mean it was just you know it was just amazing but it's because she because she had the recipe right she had the recipe so orientation toward the future now the next one that we talked about with the uh the Harvard uh study was um optimism forgiveness and gratitude so let's start with optimism, you know, those yeah, people like that, because, you know, as you said before, Harry, that's that positive attitude. People who see the glass as half full, mm-hmm. people who can find the silver linings, mm-hmm. those are the people that do best. They age the best. And those are the people that other people want to be around. You know, nobody right. wants to be around the Debbie Downer who, you know, oh, it's a beautiful day. Yeah, but I hear it's going to rain tomorrow. Right. So what? Today's beautiful. Today, Let's just yeah, enjoy, enjoy today, today, you know. So and whenever I, I used to do this presentation for um, the Council on Aging Directors, I would say to them, who's the person when you're sitting in your office and you see people coming in the building who are the people that you say, oh, 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 so-and-so is coming, and you jump up, you know, and then who are the people where you go, oh, my God, and you just want to close your door. It's like, because <laughs> you know it's going to be negative, 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 right. and just people don't want to be around that. So the people that are positive are the people that you want to surround yourself with. So that's sort of that um, optimism. And I might want to add here, too, that yes. every person that enters the Westfield Senior Center is filled with optimism. I, we like to hope so. <laughs> <laughs> most of them are. You know, right. I think most of them are. And my mission in life is if they're not, when You're they come in, that way. we're going to turn them into I it. I love yeah, it. We're going to try it. to turn them into I it. I love it. Um, another one sort of, as I said, that got lumped together with the Harvard study, they lumped together gratitude, forgiveness, and optimism, and I'm teasing them out. So let's talk a little bit about forgiveness. Yeah. So I have another book, which I, because I have multiple copies of this, so I was able to bring this. So this is um, Joan Chittister's book. It's called The Gift of Years. Where am I here? There it is. Pointed up towards camera five here. There there he is. Yeah, he's got it. Yep. There it is. So it's called The Gift of Years. And um, it was actually a group of older adults at Springfield College when I was um, director of the Learning and Later Life program that brought this to my attention. They asked me to do a presentation on it. And I said, perhaps I should read the book first. (laughs) I had never heard of it. But so I did. Um, And now I've done lots of presentations. And I've used this book a lot. And I've given this as a gift. It's a wonderful book. It's, um, it's, it's broken down into um, just sort of life um, truisms, I guess. And uh, anyway, she talks about forgiveness. So I want to I talk about, um, I want to give you a quote from this book. Uh, Joan Chittister says, and I believe this is true, <clears throat> the unselfish generosity of forgiveness is a myth. Forgiveness is more important to the person who is forgiving than the one who is forgiven. So if oh. you're the person, you know what I mean? Right. Think about it, though. If you are the person holding the grudge because somebody maybe, you know, did something to you that really was terrible, it's it's not so much, it's when you say to that person, you know, I forgive you for mm-hmm. this wrongdoing, the idea is you're, you know, you're making that other person feel better. But the truth is that you're making yourself feel better because yeah. you can get other, holding a grudge takes a lot of energy. Yeah. A lot of negative energy. Right. And so if you can let go of that, I think right. that's the point that she's trying to make. And then I really like this quote. It's in the book. And this is a quote from um, a poet and her name is Mary Lou Kanaki. And she says this. Only we can free ourselves from the burden of bitterness old anger brings with it still. 
think about this. Do we even remember clearly anymore what it was that happened? Are we really sure it was as intentional as we have painted it all these years? Is there nothing that explains it, that mitigates it, that makes it understandable? Is there anyone we wouldn't love if we only knew their story? Hmm. And, you know, I've worked with families, Harry, long enough to have seen this. And I used to do hospice work. And and hospice work is, is really challenging because people are typically at, you know, the end of their life. And I cannot believe the number of people who have family members who have they have completely disconnected from, whether it was children, oh, sure. siblings, you know, ex-wives or husbands. Mm-hmm. And I think a lot of times it is like this. When you get down to it and say, well, well what happened? The story is either so vague because I really can't even remember it. I just remember that I was so mad at the time. Sure, it could have been something that happened when you were in your 40s or 30s or 50s, and now you're in your 80s or 90s. Um, Or you've turned the story around, and the story has really changed over the years. And I think that's her point is, Mm -hmm. you know, do we even really remember what caused this? And is it worth holding that in? Right. So I think that whole, you know, forgiveness piece is important. And then the other piece that um, that the Harvard study talks about is gratitude. Hmm. You know, you could do a whole, we could do a whole presentation on the attitude of gratitude. And I've done that at the Senior Center. You know, we've talked about how important gratitude is. There are pages and pages of research and charts that have been done on personal well-being, physical health, emotional health for people that tend to be, um, you know, sort of have that attitude of gratitude. So I'll just name a few, but gratitude tends to make us more optimistic. So that goes back to the optimism and the positivity that we were talking about because um, optimism in turn makes us happier. It improves our health. It's been shown to increase lifespan by as much as a couple of years. Well, you know, some people are 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 so concerned about whatever, you know, their physical health, their their dietary intake, you know, in order to what? In order to, you know, live a few years longer. Well, here's one and, you know, just just show gratitude. Mm-hmm. Feel it. Really feel it. Mm-hmm. And guess what? You can live a few years longer. So how easy it is that? Uh, gratitude tends to strengthen our emotions. It makes our memories happier. Um, it lets us experience good feelings and, and it helps us to bounce back from stress. And that's important. Yes. Um, and we'll talk a little bit about stress later on. And then gratitude, which I think this is the most important. Gratitude makes us less self-centered. Okay. Because gratitude, the very nature of gratitude is the focus is on other people. Sure. You know, you're, you're grateful. You're, you're thankful for, you know, the person who cut your, cut your grass for you. You know, my, my neighbor's kid went and took my trash cans down to the curb for me. I'm, you know, so thankful for that. It was just a small thing, but it meant a lot to me, you know, just things like that. So gratitude in general makes you focus on other people and not yourself. Mm. So that's really important. And although it's not a cure-all, it has been massively underutilized as a tool for improving life satisfaction and happiness. And I truly believe that. Mm. I really think gratitude is important. Um, The next uh, on the list from the Harvard study is empathy. And empathy, uh, I have my background in my is in social work um, and my undergraduate degrees in social work. And that is social work 101. (laughs) They, they, that is social workers are taught and trained to be empathetic, not sympathetic. And the difference is empathy is the ability to feel with someone sympathy. You feel for someone. So, Mm. and a social worker, you know, if I say to you, Oh my God, Harry, I feel so sorry for you. That's okay, but it's not helpful. But empathy is trying to look at things through your perspective, okay. through your lens. How are you seeing things? You know, we there's so much happening now, like with the Black Lives Matter movement. Right. And part of that is getting those of us who are who are not black, we are not people of color, to see things through their lens. Through their what lens. must it right. feel like? When you feel like you're targeted, you know, right. and that could be any group. I mean, that, that happens to be an example that's so mm-hmm. out there in the news right now. But it's so empathy is really feeling for other people. Mm-hmm. So are you the kind of person or friend or or, 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 or relative that people will confide in, um, you know, sort of when they feel like their world is falling apart? If you're that kind of a person, that's 
going to help you with your own aging because it means you have that ability to really understand, try to put yourself in somebody else's position. Um, are you truly listening when somebody explains their situation? It's hard to do. Mm-hmm. Being empathetic is really hard to do because, you know, sometimes you just think, oh, it's like, I don't get it. You know, mm. what are you, what, what? You know, this is so foreign for me. So really trying to put yourself in somebody else's position. Mm. Um, and I always say to people, are you the kind of person that will hold somebody's hand when they're going through their struggles? Not just kind of watch from the sidelines and, you know, cheer them on and say, gee, I hope everything turns out okay. Call me, you know, call me in a month. <laughs> but are you the person who's saying, call me anytime. Call me at two o'clock in the morning. If right. you know, if because you're in crisis right now, if that's what's going to help you, so that ability to be empathetic and to feel empathy is actually something that's going to help you to to age more creatively. Mm. And then the last one on the Harvard study um, is relationships, and I saved it for a lot. It's the most important. It is the most important. I would agree. The ability to reach out, mm-hmm. our relationships. And how happy we are in our relationships have, have a powerful influence on our health. Hmm. So close relationships. And there's have the Harvard study kind of brought this out, but there have been numerous um, studies done on relationships versus things like money, fame. Um, you know, is it money that makes people happy? No, I mean, money can't buy happiness. It can right. certainly help with your life. But it's really relationships, more than money, more than fame, more than education, um, more than financial, um, you know, uh, stability, actually. Um, Those ties protect people from life's discontents, and they help to delay mental and physical decline, and they're better predictors of long and happy lives than social class, IQ, or even genes. So all that came out of the Harvard study. Uh, you know, I, I think just to talk about relationships for a yeah. second, you know, in this this whole COVID epidemic that we've been part of, uh, it has been the lack of relationships. We see that with children mm-hmm. in the schools, uh, people who are dying in the hospital, who are dying alone, and the nurses. Yeah. You hear these stories of nurses and doctors just holding their hand because they need to have somebody. But what we find when we are forced into an isolated environment is that we just truly miss people. Yeah. And that close relationship to do things, to talk with them, to commiserate, to be a partner, just to be around yeah. them, it's part of who we are as a social being. And it's, yeah. it's tough not to have that. And I think it as is. you get older, you know, I used to hear this from my mom who died when she was 92, 93. You know, all my, all my sisters and brothers are gone. My parents are gone. My friends are all. She was the last one. Mm-hmm. And it was tough for her because although we were her children, we didn't live there near yeah. her. So we didn't yeah. see her all the time. But yeah. she had no one to, to hang out with yeah. on a regular basis. Yeah. And where she lived, there was no great senior center like we have in Westfield. Yeah. And yeah. so she was very lonely and it really affected her. Yeah. I mean, I think, uh, you know, you brought up you brought up the pandemic and COVID, Harry, and, and kind of what's been happening. I mean, part of, you know, we have made well over 2,000 telephone reassurance right. calls since the pandemic started. And that's, and that's part of it. That's why. I mean, we're trying to at least target some of those people who don't have family. But that's why FaceTime became so important. That's why a lot of the senior centers started offering telephone tutorials on how to use an iPad or how to use your laptop in order to do, you know, FaceTime or Zoom with your family and your grandchildren. Um, And the people that were not technologically savvy or, you know, didn't have access to the internet, internet, you know, really struggled the most throughout the Mm -hmm. pandemic. I mean, some of my seniors just shocked me. I mean, some one woman just absolutely had me in hysterics. She said early on in the pandemic, her kids got her an iPad and they're trying to walk her through this process. And it, oh my God. But she got very good at it because, you know, she said I made right. lots of mistakes, but ultimately. Right. And so then her friend for Christmas got one and she was instructing her friend over the phone which her kids and her grandkids thought was absolutely hilarious this is like you know the pocket you know like the blind leading the blind over here but you know what the reality is is they 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 were getting it you know they weren't getting it maybe like an it person would but certainly enough to to stay connected so there were a lot of people who did that but you're right harry those those stories were just you know that came from the hospitals um, and came, we heard them through the lunch line. We had mm-hmm. people, special, especially early on in the pandemic, 
who had lost spouses and couldn't be in the room with them, couldn't yeah. be at the hospital. You know, um, we're right. trying to do things over the phone and cell phones. Really heartbreaking. And it, was, it was heartbreaking. Right, right. But you're right. I mean, relationships, and I think that, you know, certainly it was the Harvard study that really, at least for as people aged, you know, highlighted the importance of relationships. And, then of course, now there have been many, many studies that have supported that. But, you know, just as a quick uh, just follow-up point, and then we'll move yeah. on to our next yeah, no, uh, that's okay. point here. Um, there's nothing that you can find and say that was good about the epidemic. But the one positive that did come out of this was we learned how to communicate using social media mm-hmm. and the use of cell phones and iPads. Yes. And yep. The ability to be able to dial in and basically connect mm-hmm. and be able to see the person mm-hmm. and then reverse the image and you can do a scan of their living quarters or see where they are. Yeah. But it's so much more, it's so much more powerful than even a phone call because yeah. you're looking at the person. Yep. And, you know, I'm the oldest of six uh, siblings, and so that's how we communicated yep. all winter and with yep. our nieces and nephews. And the ability to see them, for them to see you, to set up group calls, we're learning how yep. to use Zoom or yep. Google Meet. Yep. You know, I really encourage people to think about that, even post epidemic absolutely as absolutely when you don't live next to each other and you can't connect yeah. on a regular basis or even if you're in town or out of town the ability to use social media yep. and use these tools to connect and feel like you're almost right there with them absolutely really 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 positive absolutely. and something that we should keep in our lives even I, once we're yep. well beyond this i totally so. agree and so see optimism looking to the future you're a healthy ager. Relationships. Relationships, but you're absolutely right, Harry. I found it was really, I've been finding it's been interesting with the Zoom calls, the professional Zoom calls, where a lot of people are still working out of their home. Sure. You know, you can kind of see the background. You really <laughs> no, get a picture I, of people. It's like, ooh, I, where are you? What room is that? Yeah, or, you know, right. I'm, somebody's in their kitchen. You can see all of this. I, I, Christina Lovelace, for you know, who's on our friends board. You know, it's like, Christina, wow, look at that. <laughs> where are you? Your house is beautiful. I mean, it's forced us you know, to clean our backgrounds. It up. has. It has. I, yeah, That's I mean, so I, I could branch off into another story, but right. I won't. But anyway, so uh, let's, okay, so according to to Robert Wall- Waldinger, who is the director of the Harvard Study of Adult Development now, so he's the fourth of the directors of this. This is what he said about the importance of relationships, Harry. He said, when we gathered together everything we knew about the subjects at age 50, so all the people, the hundreds of people involved in this at age 50, it wasn't their middle age cholesterol levels that predicted how they were going to grow old. It was how satisfied they were in their relationships. The people who were the most satisfied in their relationships at age 50th, at age 50, were the healthiest at age 80. Mm. And that's what they found from, and again, they had so much data to go through. So embracing community really helps us to live longer and be happier, the importance of being socially connected. And as you said, you know, you mentioned isolation. So isolation um, or a lack of social ties is really a powerful risk factor for poor health. So, um, and there's no, you know, there's no type of support that works best for any one person. You know, relationships could be family. It could be with your children, your spouse, your siblings, your grandchildren, your great-grandchildren, your neighbor, your friend, your, you know, your maid of honor from your wedding that you don't see that much, but you, you know, you talk to. Um, And as you said, you know, now we have, I mean, you can always pick up the phone. um, And if you have that, you know, technological, um, you know, um, inclusion inclination, you know, Zoom and, and FaceTime and all of those things are really, are really mm-hmm. wonderful. Um, so in, important, uh, important relationships. Um, loneliness, interesting, or isolation, according to Wallinger, um, he said loneliness kills. It's as powerful as smoking or alcoholism. And that wow. was something that came out of wow. the Harvard study because the opposite of, you know, they were looking at who aged successfully, but they were also looking at who didn't age mm-hmm. successfully. Um, and this, uh, the, the piece on loneliness taken out of, I took this out of The Gift of Years by Joan Chittister. It says... And I think this is important. If we're lonely, it may be because we have not looked around to see who needs us. A person who is needed, really needed, is never lonely, never isolated, and never without a purpose in life. 
So my advice is pick up the phone and call someone, perhaps someone you haven't spoken to in years. Um, Gary, my husband Gary, during Lent, he decided for his, um, what he wanted to do for Lent was each week, he would call someone that he hasn't talked to in a very long time. Um, and so he has been reconnecting with people in some cases that he hadn't talked to in 20 or 30 years and, you know, tracked him down through social media, got a, got a phone number. And, you know, there wasn't one person, Harry, that said, who? I don't want to talk to you. I mean, most people are like, oh, my God, this is so <laughs> great. And, you know, he was on the phone for two hours. Right. So pick up the phone, send an email or better yet. Write a note, send a card. People still yeah. like to get things in the mail, like in the U.S. They postal do. mail. Right. They really do. Um, who doesn't appreciate something besides a bill, right, in your <laughs> mailbox? So do that. And that's typically all you ever receive. Right, exactly. Right. So those are some of the things that um, the Harvard study of adult development tells us about the ingredients for the recipe for valued and creative aging. Um, and in my many years of experience, over 40 years now working in this field, I have a few others that I would like to throw in there. Yeah. So the first one that I would like to throw in there is the importance of mental stimulation. Okay. So the mental decline that many experience uh, results from the atrophy of connections between nerve cells in the brain. So I like to use the analogy of the broken arm. So if somebody breaks an arm put it in a cast and you're in the cast for six or eight weeks and you take the cast off and what happens you look at your arm and it's like what ha it shrunk right yeah. I mean it looks different because you have been using it and right. so the muscle mass you know just starts to uh, deteriorate deteriorate fairly quickly mm -hmm. so if you take that analogy and use it to the brain cells that's ex exactly what happens hmm. so it's not that your brain cells die off it's that they atrophy i mean if you're not using them mm -hmm. then they're just kind of sh sort of shriveling up a little bit mm -hmm. so years ago um i got turned on by this um this professor from duke university his name is is lawrence katz he's actually no longer living but i found out about the some work that he was doing at duke and i really got uh, all charged up about it because I just thought this was so great. I have to tell you, I, I talked about this at the old senior center during a presentation and my friend Gus was at that presentation and just said, well, we have to do, we just have to do a presentation on, we just have to talk about, you know, Lawrence Katz and his work. Um, and so what Katz said was that the brain forms associations between different senses. And so he came up with this whole idea of brain exercises. And the basic idea behind brain exercises is to use the brain's natural desire to form associations to do things in different ways that cause it to form new associations. So essentially, it's taking the arm that had mm. been in the cast yeah. and now starting to use it again, but maybe in some different ways than what you did before. So when the brain does this, it causes the brain cells to become more active, which is what you want, and it helps to produce brain healthy chemicals. And so using activities in everyday life to stimulate the brain in new and interesting ways will help to promote mental stimulation. Mm. Okay. So according to Katz, what he says, and this, I, I so believe this, so I think this is such a simple concept. He says, at brain atrophy is associated with routine behaviors that require little brain power. So think about the things you do every day. Brushing your teeth. Right. Do you think about that? No, you don't think about brushing your automatic. teeth. It's automatic. Right. You don't think about it. Driving, for me, driving to work. Right. I mean, it's automatic. I automatic. get out of the, I'm, I'm going to turn right here, left here, right here, go straight. It's mm -hmm. automatic. I, I don't, those are all things that we don't think about. So an important aspect of brain exercise is to force the brain to not rely on stored patterns of information. It has to develop newer, new ones. Mm. So he created what he calls neurobic exercises. So, so Gus made me do this whole series on neurobic exercises, and I had handouts on neurobic exercises. <laughs> but basically, what a neurobic exercise does is it, it helps to, the brain to maintain connections between nerve cells and then to develop new connections. Mm -hmm. So neurobics, according to Katz, is doing something that challenges and engages the mind, something that is different from what you normally do. So, 
what he says, and this is so cool, you, you have to try this. I hope our viewers and our listeners will, will try just some of these. Just try sure. one or two, and you'll see how challenging it can be. So at home, I did this. I did this. Actually, I did it in my office. Move your wastebasket. Move the wastebasket that's either in your kitchen or in your bathroom, something that, you know, where you use it all the time. Because now, when you go to throw something away, oh, it's not automatic. You, you have, have to, to think, think about, about this. Where it now, is. I'll tell you what happened. Several weeks ago, we oh, had funny. we had a we had a leak underneath the kitchen sink, which is where the trash can is. Our kitchen trash can is. So you know, Gary was putzing around with it, and he said, "All right, well, let's take the trash out. We'll move the trash. We'll move the you know the trash can." And um, you know, he tightened things up and we put towels down and we got all the water out. And he said, but we ha he said, but I want to make sure it's not still leaking. So leave the trash can out. Do you know how many times, <laughs> Harry, I went to throw a napkin, a tissue, Automatic. a paper towel. I opened up underneath yeah. the sink, I opened up the cabinet door and threw it in, looked down and said, I just threw that on the floor because the wastebasket of the trash can oh, now that's funny. is somewhere over right. here. But that's so true. But it's so but it was such a good brain stimulation right. thing because it was like now right. I did that automatically until I said, Okay, okay, wait a minute. So now what I did was I kept the, the door open because that was my reminder of the wastebasket is not under there. You're you right. got to go find it, Tina. It's right. someplace else. Right. So doing that, rearrange a drawer or a cabinet. Here's another one that I did. So about two months ago, um, we had Gary and Grace, between the two of them, my husband and my daughter, have this assortment of water glasses, you know, water mugs and, you know, sport mugs and right. drink mugs and all this other cups and you know covered things and everything and some of them are fairly long they're tall so they didn't fit in the cabinet that the other juice glasses and stuff were in so they ended up all over the counter you know in this space and finally we had quite the collection and I thought okay this is ridiculous <laughs> so I went through all the cabinets and I said oh I have a cabinet here and the shelving if there's a, a, a really tall space between the bottom shelf and the, the, the second shelf so I'll put them in there. Well, that meant I had to move what was in that cabinet someplace else. So there was just a little rearranging of cabinets. And it has taken me two months <laughs> to, you know, when I go to get my notepad oh. to make my shopping list, it used to be where now the cups yeah, are. Sure. Now, the Grace and Gary said they love where the cups are. They're convenient. They're out of the way. They're not spilled all over, which is great. But I moved everything that was on that shelf next else. door over oh. here. Sorry. And again, but... But as but see, cats would say that's perfect. That is an aerobic exercise mm. because now it's not automatic that I need a pen or a pencil and a right. pad. Right. I've got to think about where is that, right. and that's the whole idea behind aerobic exercises. Interesting. Um, drive a different route. Try mm. doing that. I've done that. You know, it's like okay, well, I'll take a different. But now sometimes you have to do that if you end up in a detour. Sure. And you know, now you've got to think about. I can tell you. I did so many aerobic exercises when they were tearing up the downtown in Westfield. Oh, yeah. Because to get from the senior center to different. City Hall right. just to do, you know, a deposit or check the mail or whatever, it would be, okay, well, that's blocked off now. I don't want to go down there. <laughs> that is all torn up, and I don't, my car is going to be filthy. So I developed this like elaborate labyrinth of, you know, right. detours and ways to get to places. But cats would say, Lawrence, cats would say, that's beautiful. Mm. That's use, that's mental stimulation because you have to think about that. Mm -hmm. So that's the whole idea behind aerobic exercises. You can come up with a thousand of them. I have a handout. If anybody wants like the handout of, you know, different ideas, um, you know, spending time in a new environment, oh, that's always yeah, good sure. because it's, you know, that's that requires all of your senses. Right. Um, taking a sh Take a shower with your eyes closed try doing that if you've ever had like eye surgery or anything you oh have to do that goodness, right try doing that it's really you get really turned around right. even in the shower i mean right. it's like wait a minute where's, where's the, the water coming from and where's where do i keep the soap in relationship to where the water's coming <laughs> can from? i get really the soap back where it's yeah, supposed to be exactly. so it doesn't end up on the floor or how about this you know we talked about brushing your teeth but now try doing it with your non-dominant hand oh 
That's hard. I've had people that That's have had strokes and have right. had to do that. And that is very, and doing anything, you know, writing with right. your non dominant hand or doing anything with your non dominant hand. Yeah, I've um, done that where I've injured it from skiing. Yeah. Or something and oh my gosh, it's brutal. Right. And so on the one hand, you think, oh, this is awful. But see, cats would turn that around and look for the silver lining and say, yes, but think of how, think of all those brain connections that you're right, making. Right. So anyway, brain stimulation, really important. All right, let's move on to uh, the last couple couple of things that I want to talk about. One is the impact of stress and how does stress affect us in terms of healthy, valued, and creative aging because Mm -hmm. stressors can be a real problem. It's one of the biggest culprits of unhealthy aging Mm -hmm. is stress. Um, And aging studies consistently show that the healthiest agers are particularly adept at shedding and managing stress. And I really want to emphasize shedding and managing stress. Mm. It's not that the people who live to be, you know, to, uh, centenarians don't have any stress in their life. I mean, it's not like Anna Wilmot didn't have to live through the Great Depression. Mm. She did. You know, they lost the house. So, you know, Fred lost his job. I mean, things happen. So right. it's not because some people <clears throat> believe that. It's like, well, so-and-so lived to a ripe old age and they're, you know, they're so healthy and everything because, you know, they're so lucky. Well, no, they're not lucky. I mean, most people don't go through 80 or 90 or 100 years of pure luck. Mm. You know what I mean? But they've learned how to manage stress and shed stress. That's really important. So let's talk a little bit about um, distress and and how that typically works. A lot of people have heard of the fight or flight syndrome of, you know, when you're in a stressful situation, a real, like like an emergency stressful situation, a car accident, a burning building, uh, you know, a mugging out on the street, um, people people will be able to do things. I mean, how often have we heard about the mother or the father who right. was able to lift the car off of, oh, you know, yeah, their sure. child who ended up underneath? How is that even possible? Well, it yeah. actually is possible, mm. even though somebody may not typically have the strength to do that because your body kicks in in a lot of different ways and it and it 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 um, prepares itself very quickly it's sort of instantaneously for that fight or flight so the your heart rate your blood pressure your breathing rate those will all increase okay so that you're delivering more oxygen to your brain and your muscles and um and you're able to deal with that emergency situation Things that your body would normally pay attention to, like um, digestion, your immune system, Mm -hmm. your sex drive, those are all depleted right now because your body is saying, listen, we have this emergency situation here. We've got to deal with this. We don't need to worry about this other stuff. So that's all going to be sort of depleted. We'll put that on the back burner. That's typically how your body responds. The problem in this day and age is that a lot of us live in that like ever ready mode and so we're, it's almost like this chronic stressful situation where your body is, you've got the, you know, higher blood pressure, high, you know, faster heart rate, rate um, because you're always prepared. And that's when stress becomes sort of this distress that you're, you know, you're, you're trying to cope with. Mm. Um, ideally, that response is, it's just short lived until the emergency is over. And then, OK, right. now huh, I can take a breath. I can settle down, you know, I can, things kind of can get back to normal. Um, But a lot of times I think in this day and age, for a lot of reasons, um, you know, a lot of people are dealing with that sort of chronic stressful situation. Mm. So how do you manage that? Well, for one thing, a lack of control often um, contributes to feeling very stressed. So one of the ways to manage stress is to seek control. And seeking control can be done in a lot of ways. I mean, some things we have control over and some things we don't. I mean, we can't control the weather. So, you know, for some people, right. that can be incredibly stressful. Oh, my gosh, you know, what oh, are we going to do? Again. Right, it's exactly. Again. Right. Well, we did, um, just to give you an example, so last week we partnered with the Housing Authority at the Senior Center, and we did um, three flu clinics for our 80 and 90-year-olds primarily. And, of course, it, they the clinics were set. They couldn't be changed and because, you know, it was the Moderna vaccine. It was the second shot. You have to do it on certain days. The, the clinics were scheduled for last Thursday, Friday, and this past Monday. 
Well, if you remember last Thursday and Friday, it poured rain. It did. And right. we ran a shuttle service <clears throat> from the senior center parking lot to the housing authority community room where the uh, – and we had a lot of people uh, because we were targeting some of our frailest – and neediest. I mean, we had people that had to use wheelchairs and walkers and Mm. had oxygen and so forth. We had to do all that in the rain. You know, there was, now we could have taken the, you know, you could have taken that. It was like, oh my gosh, we're so stressed. You know, it's, this is going to be horrible. You know, instead it was like, okay, we can't control the weather. So how can we do this the most efficiently, the most effectively, um, the most successfully, you know, despite the rain that we did have control over. It, did it require man, more manpower? Let's have one person on the other end, uh, three people driving, one person, on, two people on the other end, wheelchairs available, transfer mm-hmm. wheelchairs so we can quickly get somebody, move them quickly from our car into the right. transfer wheelchair, right up, right up the ramp, into the room. You know, so things like that. I mean, you, you, you know, people who get a diagnosis, maybe somebody gets a, a, a diagnosis of a heart condition or mm-hmm. it could be anything, cancer or, or anything – you can't, you know, the diagnosis is a diagnosis. You right. don't have control over that. But what you have control over are things like getting information about it, learning about mm-hmm. it. How did this happen? What are my treatment options? Mm-hmm. You know, some people are the kind where it's like, I don't, I won't go to the doctor because I don't want to know. Oh, you know, I no. think something's wrong. I, I work with a lot of people like that. Yeah. We have a lot of seniors. It's like, I don't want to know. The problem with I don't want to know is then you're, you know, you have no control over what happens, Mm -hmm. you know, as the pain increases or as the situation worsens. Maybe had you gotten the information and then been able to sit down with your provider and say, okay, what are my options here? Because this is what's important to my, in my life. You know, it's important that I can walk every day. So how can I make that happen? Or it's important that I get to my grandson's graduation in, you know, Oregon in in six months. How can we make that happen? Well, you know, look at the things that you have control over. So mm. that that's a really big way yeah, of helping to way. manage your right. stress. Right. Um, getting enough sleep is really important. It really is. That's another one that we could do a whole segment right. on the importance of sleep, how to get better sleep, how to manage your sleep. I mean, there are, again, a lot of information about that. Um, so I'll give you just a few little tips. One is just for the, the biggest one is just use your bed for sleeping. When you start using your bed for watching TV, reading a book, on your laptop, on your cell phone, checking your email, your body is thinking, okay, well, this is like a workspace, not a relax and go to sleep space. Oh, that's interesting. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Especially with COVID right now, that's how they've exactly into, and right. and in some cases it's really been hard for families right. especially when you've got two parents working from home kids you know three different right. kids and remote learning and so forth that has been that has been a challenge for mm. you know spaces but even if you have to use the bedroom try not to use the bed as mm. the place where your you know it, your workspace is because your body really gets very confused mm. that's um, a great point i would say the other thing you know I, again just as a, a really simple tip is just take some time to wind down before you try to go to sleep mm. and be careful again about what are you watching what are you watching on tv is it something you know if the news gets you all jacked up and wound up well for heaven's sakes don't turn that on right. you know turn on something mindless you know or or just i one of my things for just really relaxing before i go to bed is just look at catalogs you know, we used to call them wish books when we were kids, right? Let's look at the wish oh, book. Yeah, what, and that's what I do. I don't order one-tenth of what I, you know, I go through and I turn the pages. Oh, this would be something I think would be really nice. And, you know, a month later I'm going, eh, I might as well toss that now. I'm probably not going to get that. But you know what? At the time it just relaxed me. Right. And that's the whole idea behind that. But, you know, I think, too, even with television is, and I found this with myself, is not to watch a movie that's really upsetting or yes. really intense or something yeah. that's really got your mind or, yep. you know, really go with happy right. stuff or stuff yep. that, that really brings you down. I mean, we learned yeah. that as a teacher and as a camp counselor, you know, when you're running your campfires before bedtime, don't end them with yeah. really high active stuff, but right. quiet, yeah. low things that, that yep. just bring the your yep. metabolism down, your your uh, yep. your sense of energy down. And Absolutely. To your point, just be relaxed super by the time important. you're going to bed. Yep, super right. important. I my wind down channel is HGTV. You know, it's just people looking. I look at homes. I think, oh, what a pretty kitchen. Oh, I wonder if sure. we could do something right. like you know what. 
it's it's as Gary calls it, it's mindless TV. I mean, I right. don't have. I'm just looking. It's there's nothing upsetting. There's nothing. You know, it's it doesn't take a lot of thought. And it's just so for me, I'll you know I'll often do that, especially if I've watched like a cop show or a medical show, and it has been a little bit more intense. It's like all right, I don't want to go to bed right now. Give me 15 minutes or so of HG. I'll kind of wind down mm-hmm. and. You know, or give me a catalog to look at, and I'll be okay. So you know, I play guitar, and I play guitar yes. every night before I go to bed. Perfect. Probably for a half hour. Well, some people. My mother was a knitter, so right. yeah. If you have something like that, a hobby, that music, you doing, right? knitting, crocheting, those are perfect type of activities. Yeah. And then you're Absolutely. really wound down. Yeah. You're quiet. Your mind is ready to go oh, to sleep. And I hope in my next life I can play a musical <laughs> instrument. I would. Th- I, that would be my dream. And I want to finish up, Harry, with you know what I know is near and dear to you, and that Absolutely. is that is the importance of exercise as well as to you. Yes, you right. really can't talk about right. valued and creative aging without throwing a little bit about exercise. And again, of course, we could do a whole sex- session just on the importance of yeah. exercise, but. Exercise really is a solution for almost every single health problem Mm -hmm. that there is. And there are so many, you know, we know now so much more than we knew 50, 60, 100 years ago about how we define exercise. I mean, you know, you don't have to be running a marathon. Mm -hmm. You can be walking. You can, we've shown through Channel 15 and the Senior Center Programming with Pete Coles, you know, you can do exercises in your home. Mm -hmm. You, you know, you turn on your TV and there they are. Remember Jack LaLanne? He started that so many years ago. But, you know, and Richard Simmons, I mean, it was all of Jane Fonda. It was, you know, all those workouts while you were, you know, watching people on TV. We have Peloton. I mean, there's just so many ways to exercise and so many levels of exercise and it doesn't have you don't have to be working up a big sweat or anything there are lots of ways as Gus showed us too you know he had a few you know juice cans and, and <laughs> soup cans and he had some bands you and can absolutely and, use things in your home to help abso- exercise absolutely and we showed that was one of the things when we started doing the exercise programming on channel 15 when the uh, pandemic first started I said to the instructors all right, look around your house because if you recall, Harry, when we first started, nothing was open. You couldn't go to right. Walmart and get anything. I mean, you know, everything was closed. So it's like I said, people can't go out and get two pound weights. So all of my instructors, I said, look around your house, including Gary and Grace, yeah. because they did one. I said, all right, look around the house, mm-hmm. bring in your props. And, you know, we've all got things around the house that we yeah. can use. So exercise is especially good for dealing with stress. Um, the stress response is all about boosting energy to the muscles and using those muscles during exercise is an obvious outlet for relieving stress. <clears throat> it's really important, and I tell people this, when they you know, really decide that they want to start exercising, if they haven't done it before, to find something that you enjoy. Because the benefits of exercise are only as good as what you're doing today. Mm. If you were a great football player in high school or track and field or, you know, swimming or whatever it was, that was great in high school. Right. But if you are 70 years old today, that's not helping you. So yeah. it's whatever you're doing today. That's a great So point. I, I always say to people, find something that you like because then you'll stick with it. Mm-hmm. You know, doing it once every six months because you feel like you have to is not going to be beneficial. Right. Um, if you like walking, go walk. If you've decided, you know, some people say, well, ugh, I hate running, then don't run because mm-hmm. you're not going to do it. You're going to force right. yourself. It's going right. to be awful. Find something else. Do you like, uh, you know, bike riding, bicycle? Mm-hmm. Do you like swimming? You know, we have options for that in Westfield. Mm-hmm. So find something that you like in order to uh, in order to do it. Um, remember that we have different types of exercise. So again, just to really, you know, give an overview, we got aerobic exercise which is going to increase your endurance and flexibility is good for your heart and your lungs so that would be anything like walking running dancing you know zumba uh, hiking swimming i mean there are a lot of a rope rowing you know if you like paddle boating or any of those um weight training which is going to increase your muscle mass and your mu- muscle strength and that's important um, and an ideal is really a balance of both of those things. So ideally, you want to be doing some of some of each. I'm going to give a little commercial plug right now because <laughs> one of your former employees, did you know Carol Palmer did a, a program for us? I saw that. It's called Totally Fun Fitness. I would be Carol. And 
Oh my gosh. Car- you know, I watched that video yeah. and I thought she is in her element. But Carol really in that in that vi- in that um, program does a little bit of everything. There's a little bit of aerobic stuff, there's some balance, some strength training. So you know, you do that. I think it's about a 35 minute program um, and you're golden. And you know what? She is just you, uh, she's the kind of person that just makes you want to get up and start doing it. Yeah, she's very charismatic. Oh, she was. Yeah, she, she just draws you in. She just has that natural energy and much like you, very yeah. bubbly, outgoing. Yeah. And you she's know, just when, passionate. When about I was it. at the Y, and I spent over 16 years there, she was my uh, active older adults. Active adult or adults. Thank you. Yes, Thank director you for of active me. older adults. Uh, but she was she was like the Pied Piper. You know, they came in because of her, and she ran those classes, and those classes were packed, and people loved being around her because it was always fun. It was positive. It really relates to everything that you've been speaking to right yeah. now. Yeah. yeah. And, no you know, question. it goes back to when we use the analogy of the broken arm. You know, if right. you, what when you're not exercising everything – your muscles tend to atrophy. Right. They lose you lose muscle mass, right. and your bones, by the way, also become more porous. When you stress your bones yeah. in a good way, when you're exercising and moving, that makes your bones denser, and so sure. less likely for hip fractures, you know, broken arms, and things like that. So that's why all of that is important. It's important for bone density, muscle mass, uh, balance, strength, cardiac. It's all of those things. Yeah, so. no question that. Um Weight-bearing exercises are critical, much more for women because of yes. the whole issue of osteoporosis. Yep. Yep. But really building that muscle, uh, that not the muscle mass, you're doing that anyway, but yep. bone density, bone density is so yeah, critical. Exactly. So, yeah. The other thing I was thinking about, too, is that, you know, we were just talking about sleep, but, you know, exercise really helps with sleep. If yes. you can just tire the yes. body out. Yes. You know, I'm, yep. you and I are very, you're kindred spirits from the standpoint that we exercise every day. Yeah. If I have to miss because of meetings or travel or whatever it is, I have trouble sleeping because I haven't tired my body out. I haven't yes. burned off calories. Yeah. And you know what, Harry? I think that's a great way to sort of end this segment is that all of these things, you now have the recipe. Right. Here it is. I've given you with the ingredients. It's a mix it's of a lot of stuff. It's it not is just a mix, but thing. you know, as you're pointing out, it's all related. Right. You know, one thing goes with the other. We talked about gratitude and how that kind of automatically creates that empathy and that optimism right. and exercise, and that automatically is going to help with sleep. So all of these things are interconnected. It's not yeah. like there are these different segments that you can, you know, space out this way, but they're all interconnected. So. There's your recipe. It's all those ingredients. So if you blend right. those all together, <laughs> you're going to come out with this amazing creation of, you know, of this uh, fantastic meal. <laughs> so well, I sweet. think so. it's, uh, you know, we have to, as we wrap up here, I think that's a great, uh, great way to end this segment. It, 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 life is about, it's a recipe. Yeah. It's about blending all the different pieces that you can't have just one thing to have a happy life. You've got to look yeah. at all the different ingredients the different aspects that are so important to you. And if there's one thing I've learned today as I've listened to you, um, be positive, have a purpose in life, give back, be generous, manage your stress, connect with others, make sure that you're mentally stimulated. You know, my wife is constantly getting these different videos and she's, yeah. we're constantly watching. We go on video tours of Grand Canyon yes. or, or the creation of, yeah. of, of mountains and all these different things that you can watch and still learn as you go forward and Absolutely. you're doing it in your own home. And then the importance of exercise, but it really is, it's a true recipe in order to stay young yep. and have that quality of life. And I think that you see it every day is that you have people that come through your center that mm-hmm. may be well advanced in age, mm-hmm. but in spirit and mental, their Absolutely. mental approach to life, they're still very young. Yep. And, and sometimes I'll do that. I'll have student interns with me and I'll say, all right, there's a woman in this room who's over a hundred years old. Who do you think she is? Yeah. You know, and they can't, they can't, they right. would have no, they have no idea. But, you know, Louise Fleming is 104. I think she just turned right. 104. We celebrated that. And, you know, Louise is one of those people, delightful sense of humor, totally, you know, like, with it. I mean, you know, just, <laughs> I mean, she can hold her own. It's fascinating background. Right. Um, and, but, you know, I think the other thing too, and, and really probably a nice way to end this, um, Harry, is to say that this is your 
responsibility. You don't have to, don't wait for other people to come to you. Don't wait for other people to bring the ingredients to the recipe. You have to do this. You have to take the book. You have to take control. You have to decide, you know, if, if you're, if you're lonely, it's up to you to start that ball rolling of reach out to somebody. Mm -hmm. All you have to do is reach out to one person. That'll start the, that'll start the ball rolling. Mm -hmm. And so I think, I think, I guess that's my, my other message is that you know what to do now, but now it's your responsibility to do it. And if you need help, if you need somebody to hold your hand, then, you know, ask somebody, you know, call, find out, find out what's going on. Oh, that's great. Well, Tina Gorman, Executive Director of the Westfield Council on Aging and the Westfield Senior Center, just love your optimism and your positive energy. Yeah. I can't think of anyone better to lead our center and, and really ensure that the seniors of Westfield have the best quality of life that they can have through the programs and services that you offer. But it starts from the top, and it's about your your personal attitude. I'm drawn to you. They're drawn <laughs> to you. you. You want to be around we people try. like that. And yeah. so thank you for everything that you're doing. And thanks for taking the time to deliver this message today. And I certainly want to say to our viewers out there, you know, make sure that you stay involved. Uh, you know, don't isolate. Don't think, well, I'm getting old. It's harder to get around. You know, let's get past that. You know, be positive in your thinking. And really think about the assets and the opportunities that are at the Westfield Senior Center, that may be at the Westfield State University, at the Athenaeum. There's so many resources in our community where you can be involved, where you can be with other people. And as we come out of COVID, now is the time to start reconnecting. You know, make sure that you've gotten your shots. Keep wearing your mask for now. But we are coming out of a really dark period. It's been hard on everyone. But stay connected and reconnect as we have those opportunities. But what we've learned today is life is about a recipe. It's not just one thing. You want to be as involved as you can. So, uh, Tina Gorman, thank you so much. And I want to say special thanks to Pete Coles, our WCPC Westfield Cable Channel 15 producer. Without Pete, these programs don't go on. And uh, we're really excited to have been able to provide number 12 here. We're going to look forward to many, many more. So on behalf of Pete Coles and Tina Gorman, I'm Harry Rock. Thanks for tuning in to another edition of the Westfield Council on Aging Presents. Have a great day, everybody.